Hi everyone. Um, welcome to Bourbon and Bitches. Our guests in this episode are Dan Beer of the Skeptical Libertarian. Say hi, Dan. Wait, do something. There you go. Um, and uh, Yvette Guinevere of uh, Science Babe, or also known as Science Babe. Um, for those of you that are unfamiliar with the show or tuning in for the first time, um, Bourbon and Bitches is a regular podcast in which the bitches, being me, Lucy Steigerwald, and uh, Tiffany Madison, who's not currently on, um, we get together and uh, chat with our guest hosts and audience and obviously drink. Um, we talk about everything from politics to pop culture and have a habit of landing on, God knows why, sex robots. Um, in this particular episode, we are going to focus on some rather controversial topics. Uh, the internet has already been complaining today on at least Facebook and some on Liberty Me as well about our topics. Because uh, we're going to talk about GMOs, climate change, and vaccines, particularly the anti-vax movement. Um, so we should probably introduce ourselves. Um, I am Meg Gilliland. I direct social media for Voice and Exit, and I'm really into entrepreneurship, startup culture, and disruptive technology. And uh, tonight, I am drinking a whiskey sour. Lucy. Lucy. Oh, I'm Lucy Steigerwald. I have a humble beer and not a whiskey sour, sadly. Um, I write things for Vice and Anti-War and sometimes for her. Um, and I have myriad interests, like defending conspiracy theories awkwardly and arguing with Dan <laughs> Beer about that. Um, and I don't know enough science to be on this panel, but this will be fun. I don't either, so this is going to be really fun. <laughs> Um, so, so <laughs> I'm going to introduce our fabulous guest for this evening um, a little better. So Dan Beer is um, a recovering policy wonk from Washington, D.C. He now lives in Austin, Texas. He is the editor of the Skeptical Libertarian uh, blog, and he's one of the admins of their very popular Facebook page. Um, TSL's goal is to promote scientific literacy and skeptical inquiry in the libertarian movement and combat junk science and conspiracy theories. Uh oh, Lucy. Um, <laughs> they're being spread under the banner of libertarianism. Um, and uh, Yvette, aka Science Fame, has uh, degrees in theater, chemistry, and forensics, and had a steady career as an analytical chemist, um, but then she launched uh, her Science Babe Facebook page last fall. Um, so that is now her full-time job, um, and her goal is to uh, break down pseudoscience for the non-scientist with a touch of humor. Um, so, <laughs> our first subject, GMOs. Um, <laughs> so genetically modified foods tend to really rile up those on both sides of the debate. Um, oh, uh-oh. Uh -oh. I'm going to take a really so you long guys are all hearing this echo. for this. Um, I don't, we don't know what's causing the echo. We have no idea. We all have on headphones. Um, uh, it's just echoing. I still, I, still, I still understand you, Meg. Like, I, I think it's not that bad. I think they're just bickering. Okay. Okay. So, dear audience, can you tell us, is this, like, so annoying that you can't enjoy the show? Answer in chat. Answer in chat. The only place you can answer. Answer. Annoying but work. All right, we're gonna go with it. <laughs> I like it. Okay, so uh, we're these are Tiffany's. Um, these are Tiffany's questions. I'm stealing her questions. So she had questions written for you guys. So uh, she said the two of you um, rustle some jimmies <laughs> when addressing the safety and viability of genetically modified foods. So. Dan, can you yeah. explain what you consider to be a GMO exactly? And, uh, and uh, what are two common misconceptions that inspire uh, uh, resentment towards GMOs? Oh, well, uh, I could go for the full like hour on this topic, so uh, just mm -hmm. cut me off. Okay, well, I mean, you've got to do. Uh, well, well, what a GMO <laughs> is, is all organisms are genetically, all the echo is killing me. Um, all um, organisms are genetically modified. Um, all, particularly all agriculture, has been modified from its natural form so that people can actually eat it. 
so we can grow it and we can produce vast quantities of it enough to feed you know billions of people uh, what we mean by a GMO is recombinant DNA modification which is where you you go in and you actually tinker with the DNA directly so rather than just you know blasting it with radiation and hoping to get a lucky mutation or uh, just doing uh, crossbreeding uh, you can actually target specific genes that have known effects and try to modify them uh, or uh, add them to organisms. Um, there's lots of different reasons why people are worried about this. Uh, one that drives me absolutely insane is the idea that the DNA from, it, it's the, the you are what you eat idea. The, uh, the idea that DNA from foods you eat actually gets incorporated into your own DNA and then you turn it into Hulk or something, I, I'm not really sure. Um, and uh, beyond that, there's just, people have a general angst about different things, you know, especially things that they put into their own body. So, you know, liberals have always, particularly liberals, have always had this worry about non-organic food, you know, mass-produced food, processed food, you know, put an adjective in front of food and they're worried about it. Um, and so, uh, the the idea is, you know, our bodies are the sacred, natural thing, and we should only put the purest, finest stuff into it, uh, and that means whatever is most natural. Uh, and the fetish about natural food um, is probably the second biggest <coughs> annoyance to me. It's the idea that whatever comes from nature is actually, uh, you know, healthy and good for you, whereas nature is trying to kill you almost all the time. Um, so I, I think those are my two biggest problems. Uh, one of them is just funny, and but it's kind of a wide, widespread misconception. And the other one really goes to the root of, I think, a lot of people's paranoia about GMOs. Anything to add to that, Miss Science Babes? Oh, quite a few. <laughs> but again, like you said, I could go on for uh, for an hour. I wrote um, actually a blog on it um, as an open letter to uh, to Bill Nye because he um, he's anti-GMO, but he also um, is uh, you know is an engineer who hasn't been working in a lab for a long time. And his point of view on it was, we just can't know. Um, well, that well, that's a very unscientific point of view. That's kind of a religious point of view of we just can't know. Well, we can test for things, so of course we can know. Um, so here's the thing about GMOs. In order to get a genetically modified organism um, into the food supply, it has to be proven to be nutritionally indistinguishable from uh, the original organism. It has to have the same nutrient content, has to have the same basic caloric content, um, it has to be to the consumer. You can't be able to look at it, sn smell it, sniff it, whatever, um, and be able to tell, oh, this is a genetically modified version of the original one. Uh, the reasons that we modify them, um, a lot of time, this go back. Uh, to, uh, to Norman Borlaug and the Green Revolution, looking at um, the crops and seeing why are these crops dying? Why aren't they surviving? Um, you know, in the wild, um, a lot of them they can we can look at the um, at wheat strains and see they were being attacked by funguses such as rust. Um, the Hawaiian papaya plant and see they weren't dying or sorry they weren't surviving um, from the Hawaiian uh, papaya ring spot virus. Um, basically, we were giving them the plant versions. Of, um, of vaccines into their DNA. So, I mean, that's one type of thing we were doing. Sometimes we were uh, crossbreeding um, at somewhat at the molecular level um, to make them hardier strains of, um, of crops. So this is, these were things we were doing. And when we did that, we had to make sure that these were not um, unsafe, both for the consumer um, and for the environment. We have done study after study. Um, and there are, at this point, there are over a thousand studies showing they're safe both for people and for the environment. I mean, I mean, I know a lot of times you'll hear people say, I was skeptical at first, but I mean, I, I really was too. I mean, these, they sounded scary. Every, everywhere you look online, there are people saying GMOs are unsafe. Um, and before I really looked at this with a skeptical eye, I wasn't sure. But um, now it's, I've looked at the data. There hasn't been a single reputable study showing that these are anything but safe. The, the data is just not there. So they're they're safe. They have to be proven safe before they're put into the environment. Um, they're they're fine for humans. And actually, they put less. One of the other arguments I can't stand um, is that they're just <laughs> they're just there um, so that Monsanto can put more of their pesticide um, into the environment. They actually use less pesticide acre per acre. Um, than their conventionally grown or organic grown uh, counterparts, their non-GMO counterparts. So that's that. Same. Good for the environment, good for people. Hmm. Uh, I, Lucy, one thing do you I'd have like anything to add? To add, add is, uh, 
one thing I'd like to add to that is uh, some of the angst might come from the idea that we're vaccinating our food, and that's where GMO comes from. But we'll, I suppose we'll get to anti-vaccine people later. Well, um, no, that's a that's a but, good point. Yeah, just but that. um, it actually it's it's saved actually the uh, the Hawaiian papaya uh, market. If you look into the uh, the Hawaiian papaya market, don't say Hawaiian papaya too many times. It'll feel like you're chewing bubble gum. Um, but if you look into that, it it really did save the market. It was dying. Um, and they found a way to genetically modify it to be resistant. Um, it, like I said, it basically gave it a vaccine, and now um, it's a it's a blooming market. So it's it's wonderful what they were able to do there. But they they do it a lot of times to be resistant to the type of um, of viruses um, and funguses that can attack crops. Um, we don't, and I mean, I worked. <laughs> I have to put this proviso out. Yes, I did work at a pesticide company, not Monsanto. Um, I've never worked at a company that produced uh, genetically modified organisms. Now I only work at Science Babe full time. I work for myself. Um, I, so my, my opinion is not being bought off. Um, but at this, it, this is, uh, I, so I've seen what it takes to put a pesticide onto the market. Um, I've seen what it takes uh, to put a GMO onto the market. Um, from from friends that work at other companies that we've worked with, um, it's it is incredibly difficult, and you have to go through a huge approval process. So there's that. Yeah. It, so if anyone has any questions other... about that, um, who's listening in, feel free to throw them our way. I guess. Yeah. One of the other huge misconceptions is the idea that GMOs are not regulated. Uh, and that nobody's oh done any testing, and we're just we're just pumping them out there. You know the Monsanto oh, yeah. Protection Act. Uh, um, but I mean, the reality is, the reality mm -hmm. is that you know it, during the 1990s, uh, it took an average of about six months to approve um, 50 different biotech applications at the USDA. And uh, during from 2000 to 2007, it took three times as long to approve half as many biotech crop mm -hmm. applications. And you know, in the last five years, uh, it took uh, nearly five times as long as it did in the 1990s to approve half as many uh, applications for bio, you know, biotechnology uh, to be put out me. into the market. It's it's it is it's ex incredibly expensive, and it takes a really long time. And the reason is that the government would, ha you know, all their incentives are to be too strict with regulation. Yes. All their like they're not they're not just in bed with you know big pharma or you know the seed companies. All their incentives oh, yeah. are they're not going to get called to Congress for you know delaying the application of a safe food. But if they put something out that has some That's maybe unsafe. tiny effect on human health, they are going to be just crucified in the public square. They'll be nailed to which the is wall. why. Yeah. It's yeah, and I mean so, I worked. Um, I worked as an analytical chemist at a pesticide company. My job was to be too fucking careful. <laughs> um, there's no other way to phrase that. I mean, if I screwed up one lab test, if I didn't record one thing or just recorded one chemical wrong, I mean, and rightfully so, I would have lost my career. Um, and I mean, I was, there were times when I would spend two weeks trying to troubleshoot why um, uh, the relative standard deviation on my, one of my instruments wasn't below 2%, why it, uh, because I normally would have it at, you know, between 05 and 0.3%. So, you know, troubleshooting machines alone, just in, and I was one cog in the system. Um, I, I would spend, like I said, just two weeks troubleshooting things at times. So, I mean, if I was at that level of care and concern, uh, think about what everyone else in the system was doing. Of course, I'm probably just part of the conspiracy. <laughs> So, yeah, right. definitely. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not being paid off, but I'm not closing the door on that. So, <laughs> if Monsanto, if Monsanto Show was listening. <laughs> it's, no, it's I, I, here's the thing. Now, because I've said I, I don't work for Monsanto, or because I've said I'm, I have not accepted money for them, um, and because I'm friends with a few of the, uh, the, the guys from Monsanto on Twitter now, um, I'm sitting here going, God, I can't go to consult for them. I've, I've shut the door on that accidentally. <laughs> so it's, but, it's, but I, I have, nailed, I put, but I have not. So. <laughs> oh, no, they're, they, the guys from there are great, though. I mean, they do a ton of really good research that's fed a lot of people. So, yeah, no, I mean, I, it's, I, one of the things that will rustle more Jimmy's than anything else is my observation that Monsanto really isn't any worse than any other large corporation. I mean, sure, they, they do things are, that I wouldn't have done, but, but, and, and I'm not just saying this because they re, they, they reposted one of my blogs on their company website one time. Although that was, oh, oh. That ruined, that ruined my credibility forever. Uh, they are actually protection. smaller. Um, 
They, here's something I always bring up to people, though, um, whenever people try to demonize them. Uh, I think they brought in something like 14 some odd billion dollars um, in fiscal year 2013. Um, and Whole Foods brought in about $12 billion. Don't tell me that one of these companies is the most evil corporation on the planet um, when one of them is trying to make the technology that is feeding starving people and the other one sells $4 uh, bottled water to rich people. But I mean, Whole Foods no. is run by a libertarian, so they're they're okay to libertarians too, or something. I don't know. <laughs> or some. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no company's perfect. You know, it's there. Everyone's like, no company's perfect. But here's the thing: every company is made is run by people. Every company is putting uh, something. And I mean, especially Monsanto, or I mean, any company is putting something into the food supply. They know that they're going to eat it. Their children are going to eat it. They are going to be putting effort, every effort into it to make it safe. I mean, that's the thing. I don't eat organic, and I was a pesticide chemist. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so. Well, that's just because so, you have to do those... or something. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> one one thing that really bothers me is just the assumption that like there's just thousands of doctors and scientists and researchers and, and employees of, of these companies, DuPont and Sagenta and Monsanto and, uh, you know, hundreds of companies and, and tens of thousands of employees who are just totally fine with like the mass genocide of the human race. I mean, that's really what you have to assume is that they they're all... all in on it and they don't care if their own children and family are, are killed and they're doing and, this and for what, doctors. for money? Statistically, those doctors have family members who got cancer, too. And they're covering up all these cancer cares, too. And they're covering up everything they did that was horrible for the human race, too. Absolutely. Come yeah, on. Of course. But, I mean, it's, uh, if you have to buy into that, you're buying into a lot more than just this stuff is safe. It's, I, I, I don't know. At some point, you have to say reality is just as you see it. So, I mean, sometimes there's going to be a little bit of spin in the media. I've seen it with my own... Um, uh, campaigns when they've hit the media, but at the same time, um, somewhere along the way, uh, th this stuff just kind of is as we see it, and the GMOs are safe. The the preponderance of research is there, so that's um, it is as we see it. Yeah, so. and uh, one more point on Monsanto. I promise I'll stop shilling for them eventually. Uh, oh, it's the, okay. The, it's okay. I'm sure you're getting your shill books right now. I it's in the mail. They promised me. They promise you know me what? I'm still so, I'm still driving a 2009 Corolla with 200,000 miles on it. My shill bucks. I am waiting. <laughs> so, you, it's carry a coupon on, for a free oil change. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna be really disappointed, just just so you know. Uh, <laughs> but um, the uh, the story that Monsanto sues companies that accidentally get cross contaminated with their seeds. I, I just want to say, if anyone has heard this story, and I don't think there's anybody who's interested in this topic who has not heard this story, it's complete yep. bullshit. It's been like five yep. minutes on Google. There's one case really? in Canada where a guy it's pretty much deliberately shit. did it, and uh -huh. uh, and they settled the case. And that was the that's the only case of of anything wait, 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 even remotely wait, wait, like this. What do you mean deliberately shit. did? It? Explain. Explain. Oh, okay. Explain. So what the. This the story is that farmers, you know, that Monsanto seeds got like blown into their fields or something and like and farmers, contaminated uh, their special organic crops or something, and then Monsanto, and Monsanto sued, them. sued them. For right. but it's it, it's not true. So what the the case was, I mean, you can just look it up. But the, what the case was that they found that this person was growing, you know, something like forty percent of their their food was their specially patented genetically modified seed or whatever. And then they sued them for growing it without paying for a license. Now, whatever you think of intellectual property, blah blah blah, that's, that's a different show. Like but shit. you can argue um, that. That's, yeah, you can argue that all day long. But yeah, but but they did not sue them for accidentally getting some of their seeds in their field. Five seeds. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah. So you want to uh, you want to make a documentary that happens. sounds really yeah. You you want to make a documentary never, that sounds really good. Make it sound like Big Evil Monsanto sent five. You know. Uh, black SUVs in the middle of the night to your house for five seeds in your yard. Makes yeah, much better television. Yeah, so it it's never happened. It could never happen. There's not a judge in the world who would who would you know keep a case in court, uh, you know, mm -hmm. on that basis. So it's, I think, just the lack of 
the lack of just plain skepticism. Like, go on Snopes, for God's sake. It's the easiest thing <laughs> in the world. Just, I, if, if you hear something Snopes that sounds beautiful. unbelievable, if you hear something that sounds unbelievable, don't believe it right. until you at least check it out. D Daniel, you're just shilling for Mon Satan now. Ooh, Mon Satan, I like that. It's new. Mon yeah, Satan. it's good. It's like treason or Stato. I'm adding that to my. <laughs> you've been, my, you've been drinking resume. more of that Hitler water, water that Bonnie water. Hari talks about. Can you hear me now? <laughs> more like yep. statism and bitches. Yeah. More like bourbon <laughs> and statism. I don't know. We'll get we'll get a we'll get a critique of of, of this show going soon. Um, this is where people tell me that I'm uh, I don't know uh, that I've been eating too many of the GMOs and of course my brain is racked with vaccines for papayas. Don't forget the Probably, fluoride. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, of course the fluoride. Um, that causes the you autism. Guys, this is like a tangent, but since you you keep making jokes about how shilly you are, I want to kind of <laughs> hear about as as a side less scientific topic so I can actually say something about it, but um, I know Dan gets a bunch of shit um, from, from his fellow libertarians incessantly, scores of times a day for um, liking science so much. Um, is, is, that, is that the same for you? And can you guys, I don't know, I, I want to hear more about, like, do you get more shit from libertarians for what you do? Like, for being, for being sellouts, for demanding credibility, and, like, what are li what's what are libertarians' problem? What is their problem with this? With, with liking their science? objection to skepti with oh, objecting um, to skepticism, things like that. Oh, okay. Uh, well, I mean, we talked about this on your podcast, which is excellent. You should everyone should totally check it out. Lucy, this is your cue to. Once I, yes, once it's it's whenever the hell it happens. So tune yes. in whenever that is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just follow Lucy. Um, <laughs> Well, I think part of the problem is that people think that anything that is, you know, libertarians tend to be just sort of a hodgepodge of people who don't, you know, make a habit out of not trusting the establishment, whatever that means to them. So when they see, you know, big corporations or, you know, big government and they're all involved with something like they, they really love to question the official story even if there isn't an official story. Uh, so uh, it, it's sort of the one step to big government test, which is that if you can connect GMOs to something like the FDA, well, the FDA is bad so because it's part of the big government. So whatever the FDA says is okay, you can't trust them because they're the government. Uh, and right. I'm, all for, I'm all for not blindly trusting the government, but I'm not asking people to trust the government. I'm not asking people to just put your faith in Barack Obama and just, you know, pledge allegiance to the Food and Drug Administration. I'm asking them to look at the evidence. You know, look at thousands of different separate independently conducted studies from independent researchers who are all finding the same conclusions. Uh, and, and then to still believe that this is all some sort of government conspiracy at that point. Uh, it, it just strains credibility to the point where if you still believe that, there's probably nothing I can say that's going to change your mind because you'll just assume that I'm part of the conspiracy. Uh, yep. So I, I think that's part of it. I, I don't know. And I, if I knew exactly what was causing it, I could go and like root it out, but I'm, I'm still working on it. <laughs> um, I was going to say that uh, Brandon in the chat says libertarians have trouble with science issues because of the policy recommendations that stem from the science example of climate change. And I was actually going to wonder about that because um, I'm going to ask about that because there is the, there is this element of mostly liberalism where they kind of have this idea that it's the chart type of, of, of liberalism. Well, we can prove this. So, you know, with science, we can sort of perfect government and sure. and, and do something that will lead definitely to this result. And I, right. I think there probably is a fear of that as well. Sure. The, the scientific uh, idea that like, you know, we're going to be run by a group of technocratic elites who are going to plan society for us and, and tell us all and, and don't let us choose. And, and that's the big fear is, is the lack of the idea that's that a realer fear, take I away. Think. <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, that's the, the idea that government's going to take away our choice. But I don't agree. I, I think that there's so many scientific, you know, what you would call scientific issues where the science points against more government intervention. Oh, and GMOs are we get, uh, a I mean, frozen it, it average. <laughs> It, it takes an, 
Yeah. Am I good? Suddenly heard Tiffany there. That was very confusing. Tiffany, uh, are you live? So uh, there's so many issues where, uh, you know, the scientific evidence points against government intervention. And GMOs is a perfect example. Uh, so is pharmaceuticals, where it takes 10 years to get a new biotech crop approved mm -hmm. because the regulation is strangling it. Um, mm -hmm. And vaccines is, an, is, a, is another example uh, where I don't think that the scientific evidence really points uh, towards uh, what the anti, what, you know, towards more government intervention. I, I think, uh, in contrast, it points against it. Um, and, and, you know, there's lots of examples, especially with food. So people have paranoia about, you know, processed food. You know, it, you know, Michael Bloomberg is the standard bearer for unscientific public policy. You know, his, his experiments in New York City with, you know, we're going to ban big gulps, but, you know, uh, Trenta Frappuccinos at Starbucks are just perfectly OK because that's what rich people drink. Uh, I mean, it, it's 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 perfectly clear that a better understanding of science would would point against the nanny state intervention, I think. Well, if I if I may, there was also um, I think it was uh, from Jonathan Rauch. There was a book called The Kindly Inquisitors where he had a very, uh, I think, a kind of poetic point, even um, everything that we want to do um, that someone might want to do with um, government intervention, we're already doing anyway. Um, we want uh, we want to force government to do things with solar panels. People are doing that anyway. Um, people are going to make pushes um, with the Tesla. People are making pushes um, with certain types of you know. People are making pushes for for things that are better for us, that are healthier for us, um, that are going to make us more energy independent because it's better for us economically. I don't think we have to always use government force to get things done. I think we're going to say this is more cost efficient. This is better for us for sustainability. And we're going to see it's going to get done through science without government force. Uh, in the, in the, yeah, chat, I think technology um, can in lead, the chat, I think technology can lead the way without um, being uh, forced through, uh, as, as Pendula would say, without uh, using uh, without using a gun to, you know, take your tax dollars from you to have it happen. Sure. Yeah, right. and, I mean, and, you know, we don't need I mean, scientific progress is not primarily being driven by, you know, uh, you know, big government state institutions that are pushing things forward. Now, in the contrast, we have government regulatory agencies whose primary responsibility is to hold back innovation. Now, maybe we think that we need an FDA because we don't want just, you know, any untested or or privately tested pharmaceutical being pushed out onto the market. OK, I mean, I'm not going to uh, I don't really want to argue about that right now in this show. But, you know, their primary responsibility is actually to keep us away from the cutting edge of science. There's a 10 year lag typically between when a pharmaceutical compound is developed and when it's actually able to be marketed. Uh, and it's a similar lag for biotech uh, crops. So uh, I think you know government's why? primary responsibility is to hold back. Uh, you know, hold back scientific progress because we're afraid of the impact of unregulated progress on humankind. Now, I'm not going to defend that, but it doesn't lend support to the narrative that, you know, scientific progress is this thing that's, you know, a, a danger to us and needs to and is being pushed on us by the government. Do you, do you know why it takes 10 years sometimes to get a new drug to market, though? Like how long phase three trials take, how long all these different trials take? Yes, I, there, and I'm saying there's there, there, I'm, there's a perfectly good reason for that, and you know uh, we can argue about I whether they should streamline the process. Representing they're holding it back is, I think, a little simplistic. Okay, all right, but, that I mean, might be. Right. You're that's, not allowing. You're not allowing. That, that you're might, not allowing an be, option for people to take a risk right. and be told risks with a drug that hasn't been tested for 15 years. And generally, libertarians object to not letting people take a risk if they're informed about, you know, maybe you'll have three arms tomorrow because of this drug, but maybe your cancer will be gone. Giving people that option right. I mean, a little faster. Maybe there's, maybe there's a perfectly good reason for, you know, the length of time it takes to get from the laboratory to the pharmacy. I'm not saying that there's not. That would be a blanket statement. And, and in a free market, I seriously doubt that there would just be a bunch of mad scientists, you know, handing out pills to, 
people on the street that I just whipped up five minutes ago. I mean, what my point here is that my point here is that what the government's responsibility as it sees it is to take you know things that you know take scientific innovation and test it and test it and test it and test it their their primary responsibility is to make sure it's safe before people are able to buy it um not to just you know whip up any crazy new thing that can make you know merck or monsanto a ton of money and push it out onto the market i mean that's their that's not their responsibility and that's not actually what they're doing i mean that's my point fair enough can you guys actually hear me now maybe anyone a little bit okay okay I can hear sorry you. about that i'm visiting Yay. family and although i love my great state of texas apparently their wi-fi is total shit. so uh, i apologize for the uh constant delay and uh, i didn't get in to come in and stir as much shit as i wanted to um unfortunately but uh, i have actually a question for you guys why i have a, a momentary solid connection um, so anti-vaccines, you know, um, I actually live in Tennessee now, but even in Texas, there's this huge movement, especially among young, yuppie housewives to not vaccinate their children. And libertarians, many of them, are right in line with this. And, you know, recent reports indicate that nearly eradicated diseases have popped up in schools. Recently, there was, you know, a measles outbreak, which the media chose to highlight as a reflection of the anti-vaccine movement. And many of the women that I think kind of go along with this, not exclusively, but just the chicks that I deal with and, and have these discussions with, they resist vaccines. And their primary argument is because they don't trust, it's not because they don't trust the science of vaccines, they do not trust the state's insistence on vaccines that they do not see as necessary. Um, do you think that the cozy relationship between big pharma and state governments, like in Texas, where Rick Perry forced children to get HPV vaccines, or you know the cozy relationship between big pharma and the federal government, contribute to this fear that a ton of really unsafe, untested, not truly vetted vaccines are being forcibly distributed? to children essentially and that this kind of buttresses this hysteria and second question for both of you since i know we're running out of a little bit of time so we may not get to climate change tonight um because i know this will probably rile you guys up but um another thing is this was a very you know, long very, very question strong link that many people argue between autism and the rise of autism and whether it's you know actually vaccines that could contribute to this or, and maybe we just haven't studied it enough, or is it that we are classifying autism completely differently now than we were a decade ago, two, three, four, five decades ago? So, you know, what do you guys think, if there's any credibility at all to arguments from the anti-vaccine crowd um, related to big pharma and government's cozy yeah, relationship? Can I grab the, uh, the, the second, second question, question first? has to do with that very very um interesting all right well first of all presupposed link between the rise in alleged autism cases and vaccines I mean, what do you guys think about both of those two big predominant issues in the anti-vaccine community i'm just going to grab that one first there has been and i mean this is i know i'm going to be told called that i'm a, a shill that i'm i'm part of the conspiracy but we're going to go for this there is no rise in cases of autism bang um, but here's um, good night, ladies and gentlemen. No, um, but here, here's what happened. Once upon a time, in order to be classified as autistic, you had to be nonverbal and deeply withdrawn. Now, think back to your classroom. I mean, where I'm, I'm 31. I don't know how old everyone is in this conversation, but most of my followers are between uh, 25 and 34 years old. Think back to your classroom when you were, uh, you know, in, in elementary school. How many kids were? Um, or diagnosed as autistic. I don't remember a single one of my class being diagnosed as autistic. How many kids, according to today's definition of autism, um, would be diagnosed as autistic? As autistic. Now we have the autism spectrum, where we're including kids who have Aspergers. We're including kids who are on the autism spectrum. We have, and I mean, we have a lot more kids who are included in the diagnosis, and a lot more doctors are aware 
that we have a bigger spectrum of diagnoses. Also, parents are more likely to ask, is my child autistic, um, in order to get special help they need so that they're more able to succeed in life. So um, we have a higher rate of diagnoses due to, um, due to higher awareness and due to a change of diagnoses. No more children today have the symptoms that lead to the diagnoses of autism or autism spectral disorder than did 100 years ago. It is a change in diagnoses and a change in awareness. Go ahead and quote me on it. It's it, you have no more children that are deeply uh, that have um, classical autism that are um, that are deeply withdrawn and nonverbal. You have a much higher uh, preponderance of children uh, that are being diagnosed as on the spectrum, and it's because we've changed the definition. That's all. Change the diagnosis, of course, or the the um, change the uh, the classification or the um, the symptoms you need for diagnosis, and of course, the number of children that are going to be diagnosed goes up. I know I'm rambling now, so I'm cutting myself off. Is it simply, I mean, there's, this is all totally anecdotal, but there are all these Absolutely. parents who claim, claim things like, uh, you know, my kids seemed like they had normal development and they got their vaccines at two and then something went really wrong. I mean, great question. Well, it's, well, it's, it's just in their heads. <laughs> No, no, it's a great question. It's because that's around, think about it this way, how old are kids when they start uh, talking? How old are kids when they, when they have autism, when they start saying rhombus, parallelogram? A lot of times, um, one of the symptoms of autism is that they're very good at things like pointing out shapes and colors, and it's around that age that, number one, they get their shots, and number two, they start having these symptoms. So, I mean, here's the other thing. We see children without their vaccines who have autism. And I believe it's Finland um, where they've kept very, very good records um, of, and I saw this, this a few years ago, so I don't know if I'd be able to pull it up again, but they kept very, very good records of children who were and were not vaccinated, and they saw the exact same uh, rate of autistic uh, kids within the vaccinated and non-vaccinated um, communities. So... It's, I mean, children are getting autism, whether they are or are not vaccinated. So please vaccinate so that your child won't get the measles. And, um, you know, it's if your child is going to get vaccinated or sorry, if your child is going to get autism, it really doesn't matter whether or not they're uh, they're vaccinated. Please don't let them get the measles, too. It's where um, we, we have ways to to help them have a very successful life now. Uh, you know, if, if they have autism. It's that's not a death sentence. Polio can be, and polio hasn't been eradicated. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I don't remember. I think that was a very cogent response to the autism vaccine link. The other thing I would point out is that uh, the concern that vaccines cause autism uh, it is just a story of ad hoc hypotheses being tacked on. So every time they'll say like, what is it about vaccines that causes autism? And they start with the assumption that vaccines cause autism. And then they find something in the vaccine, you know, to, that, you know, is alleged to have caused autism. It was, it was uh, uh, thimerosal uh, until, you know, based on pure fear mongering, it was removed. There was no evidence that thimerosal actually caused autism uh, or brain damage or, or anything of the kind. Uh, but merely to appease public concerns, uh, it was pulled from uh, almost all vaccines, all, almost all childhood vaccines, especially, yeah. um, simply to to allay public concerns about this. Now, this did exactly the opposite because they said there's nothing wrong with it, but we're taking it out anyway. So all this did was create more confusion about it. Um, but there has been it's been removed from uh, as a preservative from a number of vaccines at a number of different countries at a number of different times. And the autism diagnosis rate hasn't changed at all. Uh, you know, it, it, the trajectory it, didn't it, change. It's gone up slightly, but that's because we're getting better at diagnosing it. I just want to make sure that we're getting back straight. So it's it's just the die again. It's just we're still getting better at diagnosing. But continue. Right, right, right. I, the the trajectory of increased yeah, right. diagnoses of autism didn't change in okay. Finland or in Britain or in the United States at, at before and after any of these removals of thimerosal. So then they came up with another hypothesis and then another hypothesis because they really want aluminum vaccines to be responsible one. for, yes, aluminum was one. Uh, and then just after study after study came out that showed delaying vaccination does not delay the onset of autism. You know, uh, not vaccinating does not 
have any statistically significant impact on your, the likelihood of your child being diagnosed for autism. Uh, and so every time that this story keeps coming up, I just, I just think that like, how many more studies do we need? I mean, we're going to say it it's just the water that's in it. <laughs> right. Is it just a coincidence that like every time we cater to a public concern about this, uh, you know, this story keeps, you know, perpetuating itself based on one flawed and, and deeply dishonest study uh, in and Britain. And discredited. And widely oh, discredited yeah. and retracted and retracted mm -hmm. and was stripped of his medical license for being an unethical hack. Uh, yeah. It's, it's infuriating and it, it does a huge disservice to people who actually have autism because the people who tell you that vaccines cause autism, just you wait. They will try to sell you some magic cure for it, a hyperbaric mm -hmm. chamber or detoxing. Bleach enemas. The bleach, the bleach oh, enemas God. horrify me because children have been horribly maimed by this because their parents would rather give their child an enema of bleach to try to cure cure their imperfect to them child um, you know, rather than say my child has autism, let's try to find, um, let's try to find a therapy, you know, an educational therapy to help them, you know, give them the skills, the coping skills they need for life. They'd rather give them a bleach enema from a snake oil salesman. This is horrifying Isn't that just to me. Felonious child uh, abuse. I mean, it's, that's yeah, not exactly. anything except that, child it, abuse. That it is ought, what it, it is. Ought to, it ought to be, but just you wait. You know, every time I the comments in those stories are even more horrifying than the story itself they because say, you will always see hundreds of people saying that's the parents right to choose you know you know it's you know we, we have no business criticizing them for you know giving their child a bleach enema and some and of the parents will say they'll say oh my my child was scre and they'll say that there are worms in their child that the bleach enema was helping clear out and their child was screaming cuz the worms were leaving their child's system and it was helping their child become unautistic I wish I had That's not read this. On like seven I'm sorry. Levels. Here's the thing, <sighs> and, and I mean, I, 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 I hope that I, I wish I had never read any of this. But at the same time, this is why we, at some point I, I hope this whole vaccine autism debate at some point goes away because you know we do have, like I said, educational therapies that we can use to help people who have autism, as opposed to saying it's the vaccines and keep looking for some sort of. Um, thing in the vaccines that we're saying is causing the autism because you know what the parents of the autistic children deserve, deserve better I have members on my site who have um, varying uh, degrees of autism who are wonderful members of the site I have friends with autism they're they're wonderful I mean instead of saying I, I don't want my child to have autism so I'm not going to vaccinate say I want to vaccinate my child and you know what the vaccines don't cause it autism they don't Let's not do a disservice to the, to the people who have autism, and let's not do a disservice to my child by denying them the vaccines. And you know what? There are people who are researching the actual cause of autism. It's it seems to be genetic. It seems to be in certain. I, I believe it was the short length, uh, the shorter length chromosomes um, on D, um, that are formed in certain. Um, uh, what's I'm gonna call it? In a certain point of uh, of um, yeah, what's I'm gonna call it of. Um, DNA synthesis while they're, um, meiosis. Well, I'm not sure. I'm not a, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What? Meiosis. Your help. Either. Yes. That's <laughs> as I was reading, I was reading up on this while I was early on, while I was, um, fi fighting one of these things, but you know what? It is not the damn vaccines, but it's like the, they're no. finding therapies for this. They're finding therapies for this that are not related to the vaccines whatsoever. Um, and it's like, if we could just get away from the whole, uh, vaccine, Thing. And this could help out the people that are actually um, suffering from this or um, working with this a lot more. Yeah, and I think we actually have made progress on the, on the anti-vaccine front. You know, there's been a number of studies recently that show that anti-vaccine uh, opinions are actually on the decline in the United States. Uh, and I think that's, that's we, we really, we really, I mean, it, it's not where I'd like it to be, but I think the impact, you know, when people may say a pollster, well, you know, I heard that vaccines cause autism, but I think most parents, when, you know, the rubber meets the road, they will go and listen to their doctor and, and find someone who knows what they're talking about and who they trust, who will say, you know, I, I understand your concerns, but this is what the evidence shows, and you can, you're, you'd really be doing your child a disservice by doing this. And I think most parents out there will listen to that, even if they have heard, so, you know, my uncle got, you know, got autism after he was vaccinated, or some anecdotal story like that. 
Um, I do, I do want to answer uh, Tiffany's point about um, mandatory vaccine laws. Um, and yeah, you know, there, there's, there's a, there's a couple of different, there's a couple of different responses to this from a, a libertarian perspective. And one is that if you go and, and cough on someone and give them a deadly disease because of your idiotic choice to not be vaccinated, uh, you know, I think that's a pretty compelling violation of their right not to get horribly sick, um, merely because, you know, you wanted to exercise your right. So you have actually done them a severe harm in doing that. And the other thing is that, you know, there really aren't that many mandatory vaccine laws. I mean, there's no vaccine police that's going to kick in your door if you're not vaccinated and stab you full of needles. What the laws, the main laws that, that impact vaccination rates are mandatory vaccines in order to enroll your child in school. Uh, and that's a perfectly reasonable thing. If you had a private daycare center, you wouldn't want, a, you know, an unvaccinated child infecting a lot of your clients or if you run a private school for that matter. And as long as the government is responsible for the safety of our public schools, I think it's perfectly reasonable to say, if you wanna bring your child to our school, they have to be vaccinated because we do not want an outbreak of measles or mumps or, or whooping cough in our school. Uh, and I think that's perfectly reasonable. And, and you know, the only thing that's statist about that is the fact we have public schools, not the fact that we require people to get vaccinated in order to go to them. That reminded me there was they did find once and please don't take me out of context on this. Whoever's listening who might be anti-vax, um, they found once a slightly higher rate of vaccinations amongst uh, some special needs children, some of whom did have autism. The reason was because they went to a special needs school and the school, as opposed to the public school, the private school that was special needs required vaccines because of the preponderance of children with uh, special needs. So that was the only reason um, why they had a slightly higher rate of vaccination. We see again, correlation does not necessarily equal causation. So that was why they had a slightly higher rate. Um, I, I guess my feeling on the, uh, the necessity of vaccination, I'm not sure if I would go as high as mandating them, partially because I'm not sure um, anytime you, I think anytime you enact legislation um, you come to the point where there are people who need to not have vaccines mandated uh, for them. People who have, uh, what should we call it, who have compromised immune systems, um, people who have had legitimate vaccine reactions. There are people who have, um, what should we call it, certain types of seizure disorders. I mean, there was this wonderful PBS special that did take a pro-vaccine stance and showed um, people who anytime they have certain types of, uh, anytime people have uh, fevers, um, it'll trigger um, a seizure and they need to not have vaccines. There are certain types of, like I said, immune issues that they can't have vaccines. What type of hoops would they have to jump through to not get their vaccine? So I'm not sure if I want to mandate them. But like you said, if private institutions want to mandate, you have to in order to have this job, in order to send your child here. Um, I think it should be, be absolutely nurse, allowed hospital. to say, uh, uh, yes, if you're working yeah. at a hospital, <laughs> if you're allowed around six people, get yeah, every better. vaccine on the planet. One, one of the labs that I've worked at, I worked in a toxicology testing lab. We were dealing with bodily fluids every day. They said, by the way, we're, change, um, we're not just working with this type of bodily fluid. We're adding another one to the list. You're, get, you're all going out and getting your Hep B vaccine. I'm like, sold. Whenever I, <laughs> whenever I hear a nurse saying they don't want to get their flu shot, I'm like, are, are you kidding? Um, uh, whenever, when I go to a hospital now, um, I ask my nurses, have you had your flu shot? If they say they haven't, I'm like, get out of my room. <laughs> I want a nurse who believes in medicine. I have the right to fire my nurses, okay? <laughs> but I mean, that's the thing. Uh, private institutions have the right to set their own rules. Um, I don't know if I would go as far um, as to set them just because there are, I don't know what hoops the people who are immunocompromised would have to go through because of the mandate. But the next question is, um, I like to say your right to swing your fist ends at my face um, is, like you said, coughing on someone and giving them that disease. Is that um, the in essence uh, swinging your your biological fist at uh, your uh, your your uh, uh, your disease at yeah. my face? Yeah. 
that's well, you're, that's you're I guess practically. The next there. I'd hate to tell you that, but you're practically a libertarian with that principle. So no, well, no, I am. Uh, I'm a registered <laughs> yeah, libertarian. You, you are. I um, I'm pretty sure you are at this point. <laughs> well, no, I, I, I am a registered libertarian. So I think people expect me to be liberal because I'm a scientist. Um, I'm a registered libertarian who tends to vote liberal, kind of because I think there was a perfect quote from the guys in South Park. Um, I, it was I, I hate Republicans, but I fucking hate liberals. Um, yeah. so, yeah. and uh, if, it's if, like, I, I just, I think I just hate politics. Yeah. So it's, there you, it, it's, you guys want that's, to see that's questions? the primary, we actually have a few. Um, and one of them oh, is, sure. uh, um, pretty can good. I, I'm can interested I, in your take as long as I'm not lagging too much. I'm going to put it on the screen. Yeah. Um, this is from Scott who is awesome. He's a scientist by trade. Uh, I just threw it up on the screen. Um, he asks, what's the general take on public funding of science? I'm very fiscally libertarian. I think the private sector does it more efficiently when a profit motive is at play. But I think you need basic research where failure and risk are more acceptable, which creates a better environment for young scientists. And then he goes on to say, actually, many things that lack, and then it cut him off. <laughs> but the, the first basis is a, is a good question. I mean, what do you think about the general take on public funding of science? Well, um, well, I, I can say, I, uh, sorry, you can go ahead. It's, well, I think there's, there can be good to both. Um, here's the thing. I was on a panel this weekend with a guy who used to work with, um, at NASA, and of course he was, and I realized I was the only libertarian on the panel. Um, when, when I was like, it's, I, I made the point that a bunch of them seem to be very anti-capitalism. And I'm like, iPhone, iPhone, <laughs> this is a result of capitalism. <laughs> what do you guys mean you're anti-capitalism? It's wonderful. Um, they were arguing against it. I'm like, I, I, I forget if it was a million or if it was a hundred thousand, but someone said, I will give you a million dollar prize if somebody can, uh, can make a tricorder. Bang! Within six months, someone made a freaking tricorder. It was incredible. Um, so I was very in support of that. But um, as I know that's a little tangenty. Um, in terms of public funding for science, um, I think we do need some things that can say science is for everyone. Um, because you know we're we're gonna have um, it's you know somewhere there was a, I think it's probably from Neil deGrasse Tyson. Um, you know, somewhere locked in the minds of a very poor child, um, somewhere there is going to be um, you know, there, there's going to be the next cure for cancer. There's going to be the next um, innovation that doesn't have um, the capability um, to to get the funding, to get the knowledge into it without public knowledge available. Um, so, I mean, I think having some amount of, of public funding for science, um, having some amount of public funding for science, um, both, uh, you know, in, in business and, you know, in education, I think it's not a bad thing. Um, but I think having most of it in industry um, is is probably better. Just as someone who's worked mainly as um, as an industry scientist, I've had one government job as an explosives chemist for Homeland Security. Um, I can't talk about it too much. <laughs> um, but at the same time, it's like I think I saw things move a little bit faster um, when I worked in private industry. I think um, in general, um, even though yeah, it's like there is going to be a profit motive at play. Uh, but at the same time, everything's going to be regulated. Um, we've worked through enough from, you know, back in the day when it was like, hey, everything goes. We're, you know, throwing lead at the wall and seeing what sticks, um, you know, which is obviously really dangerous. We kind of know the dangers of what we're working with. We're making sure that things that are going to people is, is, is safe now. Um, you know, it's like, I, as you were saying, uh, as the question goes, you know, with, uh, uh, let's see, failure and risk is more acceptable. I mean, here's the thing. We understand um, the risk of what we're playing with in science now. Um, there, there is enough government oversight just with laws and whatnot um, that even uh, with most of it being, with most of science being uh, funded um, privately, um, people are going to eventually get the benefit of it. So I think it's it's fine to do most of um, science uh, publicly. I'm, I still think having NASA, yeah. or sorry, privately. I think having NASA as a public, uh, fu publicly funded thing because it takes up. Very little of our tax money, and as a force of nature, is a is still a wonderful thing. So that's yeah, kind of and, my take uh, on it. Yeah, and as far as as far as NASA goes, I'm much happier to have the government shooting rockets into space than into people. So uh, if that's really. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. Thank you. So that was a beautiful. I, I'm not, point. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 
have embroidered that on a stamp or something. I think NASA also takes up less, much less money than people realize. Yeah, uh, and you know, it's it's a yeah. lot of money, but relative to what we're spending on, you know, killing people, it's 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 almost nothing. So yeah. it's not it's More certainly not one of, it's it's not it's not at the top of my my hit list of government agencies. Yeah. Uh, as Cheers. far as the public funding of science goes, uh, again, that's also a a pretty tiny percentage of not only of government spending but of total funding of science. I mean, most research and development is funded by private industry. Uh, I mean, the overwhelming majority is funded by private industry. So when we talk about public versus private funding of science, I mean, I, you know, I just consider it sort of a side issue whether we should have public funding of science because, I mean, the government does give grants and does, you know, endow a lot of foundations to do a lot of genuinely important research, uh, some not so important, but, you know, mm -hmm. private businesses do that too. Uh, and I mean, and so I think, yeah, that's awesome. Okay, <laughs> shrimp treadmill. Stay it was a, okay. Please elaborate. <laughs> it it was a. We'll talk out. I'll send you. There was just Google shrimp treadmill. I will definitely it, yes. Google shrimp treadmill. If you haven't already, make sure. You <laughs> okay. I believe that government funded. There were, it was yes. more to it than yes. that, but that was the headline that came out. So yeah. you, uh, have, you have to look past the headline with this stuff always. But still, the headline is awesome. I, like I like when the for interrupting. like like when Russia launched uh, you know a bunch of geckos in the satellite to see be, observe their mating behavior in zero gravity, and then lost control of the satellite. That's just a fantastic <laughs> story. And with without government funding of science, we would never have had that story. So I feel like there's Wait, really what was the headline? Of course. The headline was <laughs> Russian sex ge geckos in satellites lost control of it or something. <laughs> oh, I've had one too many bourbons. Uh, and I'm out oh. of scotch. Um, but but I, as far I as the whole thing, if I need bourbon. For some additional questions, if, we actually have okay, quite I just, a few. I just want to um, finish, I just wanna finish my point on serious? public funding of science. Okay, fine. I'll, I'll be real quick, I promise. So like as far as public sure, funding okay. of science goes, it's it's not a big deal. It's it's not propping up the edifice of science in the world. So if we got rid of it, we'd survive. Uh, but it's also not, you know, if you're if you're just doing it to cut the budget, you have bigger fish to fry. So I... yeah, it, oh, that's right. like a lot of other less important things, but also not you know benign things like I don't know PBS or some shit where technically. No, don't fund that. But if you're prioritizing that, then clearly you're not. You have an agenda that's not cutting, just cutting things. You know. Let's do the lightning round on questions. That's true. Um, so you guys down to take one or two more questions? Is that good? How yep. about we do a lightning round? I can do an in a question in ten seconds or less. I, I actually Time like me. your uh, your in depth explanations. I think a lot of people are starving for dialogue on this level. So. Oh. It's good. I mean, I'm good at not shutting the fuck up, yeah. so. <laughs> <laughs> Just so, ask uh, my mom. It's impossible. From Michael Salomon, uh, what is everyone's opinion on the young woman that was forced to receive chemo treatment? Uh, I believe we can actually look up the link and throw it up here, but um, I don't remember. Well, the I've read enough. I just read in passing that there was a young yes. woman that was uh, forced to receive yeah. chemo treatment. Um, so yeah, if you, what How do you guys think about that? The one who was forced to receive uh, chemo. All right, um, I'll try to get this in quickly because I know we were planning on just doing an hour. Um, here's the thing: there's a thing about there. We have this thing called consent. It has to be informed. I don't think that any time you were, um, I, I get it. She she was she was still a minor. Her reason for not wanting to continue chemo was because it was unpleasant, um, and she said that she wanted to end her life then. A lot of people tried to compare her to Brittany Maynard, who chose to end her life. Brittany Maynard was terminal. This girl was not terminal. She just didn't want to go through chemo, which was unpleasant. A lot of things in life are unpleasant, honey. Chemo means you get to live. Get over it. Take the chemo and deal with it. I know that sounds cruel of me, but her whole reasoning was, I just wanted to, to not deal with the chemo. I know this, is very, this sounds very unlibertarian of me, but her, her whole thing was, this was, you know, the chemo made me miserable. 
smoke some pot and get over it. I say this to someone who lives in California. Trust me, it'll make the chemo a lot more pleasant. It's, I'm, I'm fine with her being forced to, to deal with this, but I really think this is a case of uninformed consent. Uh, she didn't know what the, uh, the risks were of not taking it. Um, it's because if she was fine with dying at the age of, I'm guessing, 17, uh, this, there's something severely wrong here. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, about this, uh, uh I mean, <laughs> A 17-year-old, a 17-year-old can choose to have an abortion uh, in Connecticut without parents' consent, and so a lot of people were using that um, as evidence that she should be allowed to make her own medical decisions. Um, and I, I feel like that's that's kind of a non sequitur. Uh, yes, it, it shows it shows that the age of consent is. Um, is a gradual concept. It's not an event that happens when you're 18. We gradually give you more and more control over your own body. And, you know, we do have an emancipation process if you want to, you know, get out of your parents' house because of abuse or something like that. Um, but as far as, you know, medical treatment goes, she will probably live, you know, another, I mean, Hodgkin's lymphoma is a very treatable, often curable illness. She will probably live another, you know, 60 years, maybe 50 years, uh, if she gets this chemotherapy, uh, and you know her mother supporting her decision to commit suicide in one of the most horrible ways possible, which is an untreated cancer uh, spreading through her body and, and killing her. I mean, that kind of sounds like abuse to me. So I mean, it. I, I do feel or letting somebody jump off a bridge, but really slowly. I mean. <laughs> Yeah, letting someone like jump off. Of, letting someone jump off of a bridge into you know a, you know a, a, sh a bunch of sharp pointy rocks and then leaving her there for like a year. Uh, yes. Yeah. I mean, Ten years from now, she'll be she'll be thanking those evil doctors who strapped her to the bed. Yeah, and I mean, I mean that's I, like I, I really want to be like fuck the state here, but you know we have I an can't. age of consent, and we also have a process. We also have a process of determining when you actually have a, the capacity to make an adult decision about your medical process. And that process determined that she was not competent to make these decisions for herself at this point. Uh, nope. And so I really want to be fucked. I really want to be fucked the state on this issue. But on the other hand, she's going to live. It's not going to be as terrible as she thinks it is. She just I can't. I, can't I just, I just, I just can't sucks. do it. I, yeah. I, I just yeah, can't do like, it. I'm I would sorry. like to. You got to believe that yeah. I would really like to, but I can't. So yeah, it's uh, sometimes sometimes your ideology gets over gets gets outweighed by the fact that you think, hey, maybe living isn't that bad. Yeah, I mean, and if she, was, if she had been if she had been a six year old, would we still be having this conversation? No, no but I mean, the whole the whole point of having a well, age oh, of ooh, consent wait. is that. Uh, the girl up in Canada Arbitrary. that the, the little girl up in Canada that did die yeah. um, because yeah. her parents petitioned the state and she was allowed to not get chemo. Yeah, I mean that I, that, that makes you bad parents. Yeah, she and yeah. you know, but I mean, where did this girl was, get the idea that chemo was poison? I mean, her parents. the fact that Some her shitty website was supporting her decision to commit suicide—that's really was difficult. Was she pursuing for me to like? Was she, was she pursuing ridiculous like naturopath remedies and not chemo? Do, do we know anything about that? Was it that kind I mean, of a case? The, the, the girl one in Canada, Canada I believe the one was. in Canada was um, in uh, a, a native um, tribe and wanted to use their natural remedies and was seeking out a healer. And I mean, we we all knew she was going to die. I mean, the the treatment for her cancer was was chemo. Like it was it was chemo. That's just. That's what you seek out. It's, you know, what your doctor tells you, not the treatment of a naturopath. And what they blamed her death on um, was that she'd had one chemo treatment um, several months before, and that caused her to have a stroke two months later, not the fact that she had cancer and that she'd stopped treatment. Okay. So this this one of those things that there's no satisfying <laughs> answer, I think, because it's like I had a really endless debate about child rights with some libertarians on the internet a while back and like there's really no satisfying way to resolve That's, this and feel that like is a deep rabbit hole my friend 
I will pass. Yeah. <laughs> it is. Um, but I guess, I guess the thing is, like, I've always said that if I saw, you know, I, technically, you know, on paper, like, you have the right to commit suicide. But if I saw you on a bridge, I might, you know, tackle you because... Yeah. In the hopes, a be, be, being a, hip, a hypocrite exactly. in the moment, exactly. in the hopes that someday you be happy that that had happened. Yeah. And and I feel like is, I feel like I'm actually in the reverse position, which is that if I had been, you know, a judge or a juror in her case, I think I would have been like, all right, you're 17, the risks have been explained to you. Good luck with your life or what's left of it, um, because, you know. I don't want the state to be involved in these kinds of medical decisions. But thinking about it right. as, as like if this was my child or, you know, my my niece or something. And I mean, just you thinking about it in a, a different, in a different context. makes it, Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You'd be like, uh, -uh you want to live. I want to I, I want to see you dance at your wedding. <laughs> Yeah, and, and as far as the abortion thing goes, all right, you know, I don't think anyone here really believes that, uh, you know, a 32-cell a blastocyst is morally identical to a 17-year-old adult or close to an adult person. So... Correct, but totally not, not the abortion. I, I, I totally totally have that. It, this, is, this is totally inappropriate, but I'm just saying I, can, I think it's a complete <laughs> non-sequitur because people are bringing it up yeah, and going, She's 17 years old. She's she's qualified to decide when you know to take a life or something. Like what? That's not what yeah, we're talking I'm a, about. I, I'm with Dan. I think that that's that's not relevant enough to talk about in relation to this at all. It's yeah. It's, I'm trying it's to open into the abortion wine. issue tonight. <laughs> Left my brother-in-law with a giant bullet wine opener. I'm like, wow, Texas style over here. I don't even know how to work this. <laughs> Lord. Oh, anyway, I, I'm gonna have to set it aside. I'm like, oh, I kind of want another one, but there's a bullet wine opener. So sad for me as a gun nut. I can't even figure this out. Anyway, oh. um, I, I think it's been a fun night. Actually, um, Do you have any questions that would restore my libertarian street cred? More specifically, yeah, uh, that was law. As soon as, uh, wrote, yeah, yeah. as soon as you became skeptic, it was over. I'm sorry, Jan. Yeah, you're, you're done. See, you're I done. see. Done. Oh, I see one asking about biohazard suits and uh, and when they spray fields. Can I answer that one? Yeah, yeah. I was uh, curious so, about see, you guys addressing the orphan drug question um, from Lena Bryce, but either one. I mean. Yeah, we're not in a big hurry. It's up to you guys as a time schedule That's here, since we've got people that are interested in chit chatting. We usually try to round it out at about an hour and then have an after party, but I think we're good. So, uh, All right, one edit this file. so take as many questions as you want. All right. Why is it that those who spray the chemicals have to wear full biohazard suits? Because dose makes the poison, motherfucker. Bang. Um, I should probably um, explain that a little better. Um, so here's the thing. Um, when it, we, we like to take and make memes out of these on the internet, um, but here's the thing. When we first spray uh, the fields with crops, I say we like I'm out there spraying them after I analyze them, which I am not. I'm out here throwing back uh, alcohol with you lovely people. Mm. What we do, we spray them. I mean, they're very dilute by the time we spray them anyway. Um, they're like, I mean, we're not spraying 100% pure concentrations of fluorate. Um, or glyphosate or anything. I mean, it's really something, it's only like a fraction of a gram of pure glyphosate that gets sprayed um, on, a, on a whole acre. It's a very small, tiny little amount. But at the same time, you do not want um, an organophosphate or any of these on you because it extends exposure, a, a large amount of these, um, it takes a long time to get out of your system. So you don't want it in your system <laughs> at all in any amount. So you use it just to make sure you don't have an extended exposure um, problems, a lot of it built up on you. You just don't, you also don't want it on your skin. You don't want it breathed in um, because you don't know how long it can take to get out of your system. Um, so even though there's not a large amount, uh, you don't want it on you when it's in uh, the concentration it is when it's sprayed on. Also, um, it's organophosphates and the other ones that are sprayed into the field don't take that long uh, to break down in nature. We also manufacture them um, so that they break down into uh, safe products. Once upon a time, and I also, I also know that they uh, always bring up uh, 2,4-D, um, the Agent Orange chemical, ooh, scary thing. Um, 
But once upon a time, uh, Agent Orange had 24D, and I believe it was 245D. Now, 245D is the one that made people like uh, turn uh, uh, look and look like Marshall Man. It was the one that made people like you know bleed from their eyes and you know all sorts of horrible side effects. Um, but like you know now uh, uh, now we we just have uh, 24D. 24D is is pretty safe. I mean, it's that's that was one of the safer chemicals I worked with in the in the lab. Um, we make sure that all these things we spray in the lab break down into really safe things. I mean, it's there's one product that we had, PCNB, breaks down over a really slow period of time, but one of the things it breaks down into is a dioxin. We have to make sure that it's manufactured in such a way that the dioxin level, it was less than two parts per billion. And it breaks down into that over a slow period of time, and it's only put into nature in a very, like, tiny, tiny percentage. So we put these into uh, into nature in tiny percentages. We put them in the field into into low amounts. And by the time that anybody steps into the field without a bodysuit, um, it's it's broken down. So that's why the bodysuit, um, and that's the amount that we're putting into the field in. So I hope that answers everyone's question from someone who has handled um, like 100% pure or 99 points. I think the Four eight was like ninety nine point seven percent pure. The ethoprop, the four eight, um, the uh, the tribufos and the turbifos were all the ones that could kill me at like five milligrams. I've handled and manufactured them all. Um, so I I promise you, I'm not telling you anything about this stuff uh, that um, <laughs> that will make you any more uh, prone to dying from all of the uh, the pesticides. And I've handled like liters of them on top of liters of them, and I'm I'm still very much alive, just a little bit of a weirdo. Cheers. But I was like that before the pesticides. That was the fluoride. That's me. God damn it! Don't tell them. <laughs> I, I mean, I mean the uh, the the chemtrails. It was the autism yeah, and the GMOs. Ah. <laughs> so oh, I see. I, 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 see I think it's the, just... people in the chat are talking about uh, the. Uh, Study suggesting the rat study suggesting that GMOs or maybe it's Roundup. They're bringing up Serolini. Yeah, they are. They are. Oh, uh, son of a bitch! Do we have to get into Serolini, really? We don't have to, Just but we could, point, we could point out that the fact that the rats that he was using were actually bred for the purpose of developing tumors. Yes. So even but if you gave Google them. Yes. And, and the, just, fact just that, the fact that there's no no dose effect whatsoever in the study, which is that the rats that were given Roundup directly in their water did not show a higher propensity to develop tumors than the rats who just ate corn that had been sprayed with it in the fields. Uh, so I like it when you do my scientisty job for me. That makes my life so much easier. So you're welcome. Um, so that's what I'm here for. Aw, cheers. To regurgitate cheers other to people's you, science. Dan. Thank you. Oh, I, I, I owe you one of these when next when next we're in the same part of the universe. Indeed. So uh, I can I, I could get you some good dog. Except I, I'll get you some good dog. So I'm still very proud of that. You should be. That was do we have, I call that do free we have, market at work, right? Yeah, yeah, our civil society at least. Do we have any more questions? Do we Anybody? how about we take one more? Because it's it's late. I have friends hanging out downstairs that are more. serving more um, of these. Yeah, yeah and I'm dry. Yeah, so. are amenable. Yeah. Let's take one more. <laughs> um, so we have a really good question. Uh, there's actually two really good ones. So I'm just gonna pick a random one here. Um, so Lena Bryce asks, what about government funding of biochemical companies to create orphan drugs? Do you guys have opinions of that? I didn't. Orphan I didn't hear drugs? you. You cut out. Orphan drugs? Sorry. Uh, Lena asks, damn it, I have 55% Wi-Fi right now. Son of a bitch. Uh, Lena asks, what about government funding biochemical companies to create orphan drugs? And I'll put that up on the air. I'm afraid I don't know anything about that, so I'm just going to shut up. I know a little bit about orphan drugs um, solely because I, I have an orphan disease. Um, I it's I'm not sure if I'm behind government funding for it or not. Um, here's I, I guess an ex explanation for the audience. Um, 
Orphan drugs are uh, a drugs or, or drugs created for an orphan disease. Orphan disease is when you have a disease that a very tiny percentage of uh, the population has, um, and it's it's called an orphan disease because uh, so many so few people have it that it's been orphaned. In other words, it's been abandoned by um, by mainstream medicine. They've just kind of forgotten about it. So um, I'm not is there an sure. example? Um, uh, well, it's I, I have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. It's, uh, it's a condition where all my joints don't want to stay in the socket. Do you guys want to see? No? Yes. Kind of, yeah. Yes. Uh, all right, I won't yeah. pop anything out. All right. Um, here. All right. You know, most people, when they're stretching, their shoulders stop about here. Mine keep going. That's not normal. You can't really cool. see that well in a sweatshirt. But yeah. yeah, it's like, yeah, I, I, I always have I always thought that was normal, um, but that's one of my stupid human tricks. Like my hips both kind of sublux. Uh, I have two uh, ribs that pop out. Um, I'm kind. Of, it's kind of Gumby syndrome. Um, but if ever a, um, a a pharmaceutical lab wants to find a medication that's going to be like your joints are going to stay in the socket, that would be amazing. Um, but I would lose my stupid human trick. That's also really convenient for some things. I'm like, oh, it's I I. I'm gonna stop there. <laughs> it's I really freak people out at yoga classes. <laughs> That's what it's convenient for. <laughs> I've been drinking. Sure. Um, but here's the thing, like, um, or like if a company's gonna try to start, I have to try to save myself with science now. Um, if a company is going to um, like start to try to manufacture orphan drugs, it's hard to get funding for it because they're going to say, "I, uh, you know, I found out, you know, we accidentally made this thing in the lab that looks like it's going to help regrow uh, collagen, uh, you know, for people with X, Y, and Z disorder." Oh, how how is this going to help our profits? Um, well, it's it's not going to hit more than you know 0.002 percent of the population. Oh, so it's not going to help us. So. I can see why government funding might be good for something like that because you know what what incentive would um, uh, you know would a company have to make something that's not going to help them that much? You know, boner pills going to make a lot of money. You know, that's not a lot of money in helping out someone like me who you know we're not a big percentage of the population. Not a lot of money in a new lupus drug. Not a ton of money in a new cluster headache drug. Never lupus. Yeah. That's why. And like, I, I have to say, I have to say that um, I, I also don't see a huge argument against, as long as government is funding the development of drugs. I, I don't see why it shouldn't. I mean, why it should also decide to neglect orphan diseases. Um, yeah, but you know, I mean, I, yes. but I mean, I, government, government, and politics suffers from a lot of the same problems. Whereas, if it's not popular. Uh, I mean, you're not going to have a gigantic pink ribbon campaign with lobbyists in Washington, D.C. who can really force things through a dysfunctional Congress in order to get fund more funding for the disease. So I think a lot of these diseases are, are still going to end up being neglected. Uh, and that's a tragedy. But I, I, I think, you know, if a billion, you know, if a billionaire happens to have your disease, that's the best bet, I think, of actually getting it oh funded. Oh, my God. Yeah, Find me a billionaire with Ehlers Stanlis syndrome, and I'm in for a fun weekend. <laughs> Sorry. Well, on, on my you are welcome, Dave, audience at home. <laughs> when I talk to David and Charles Koch on on my conference call tomorrow, I'll I'll ask them. I'm <laughs> on top of it. The shill, so. the shill, all the shilling, all the time. Awesome. Well, thank you guys. Um, I think we'll have a brief after party if you guys want to join. Um, I think Meg is primed to set up uh, another quick link if you guys want to hang out, chat. Maybe we can bring people actually on camera to ask questions if people are interested. I don't know what time frame you guys have. I know it's a little bit wait or a little bit late on the East Coast. Oh wait, what? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's midnight over here. I'm gonna actually wanna head downstairs. My dog has been hanging out with my friend downstairs, so I'm gonna see what horrible things my friends have been doing with my puppy. Well, I mean, we can do something for like, well, you, you bad. I've been ignoring my dog. He's being very pathetic right now. So I, my dogs actually, my friends are both dog trainers, so my dog is probably like doing backflips by now. <laughs> oh yeah. So awesome. Well, um, anybody who wants to can uh, join a little bit onto the after party and chat about these issues a little more. We can actually get people on camera and we can chat. Um, I've got about 30, maybe 45 minutes tops before because I've got to get up at five. 
But uh, yeah, it's been a really, really great chat with everyone. Thank you guys so much for your time. Uh, sorry for the preliminary tech issues that we had at the very beginning, but it was awesome. So uh, everyone, thank you so much for joining Bourbon and Bitches. Glad to be back for 2015. You can check us out at bnb.liberty.me and also at bourbonandbitches.com. We have a Facebook page too, so you better like that shit if you're nasty. And we'll be back next week too. <laughs> We've got two awesome guests that we're hoping to confirm. It's going to be epic. So, yeah, um, we've got pretty much everyone scheduled out until February and March. So we've got uh, plenty of good stuff coming at you. But anyway, thank you guys so much for your awesome discussions. We really appreciate it. I know these were complicated and sometimes controversial issues, but it's pretty sweet that everyone joined in and uh, had a great debate. And we look forward to inviting you guys both back next time. Cheers. Thank you. Night, guys. All right, everyone have a good night.